Okay, I think we are ready to get going. Um, thanks so much to everyone for being here. Um, this is both of our first times at RailsConf and we're super excited to be here as well. Um, it's been a fantastic, fantastic week, so fantastic that I'm losing my voice and I've gotten a little cold, so please forgive if I have a crackly voice. Um, I'm all hopped up on cold meds, so this should be an entertaining <laughs> presentation anyway. Um, so my name is Rosie, and I'm joining you here from Minneapolis, and this lovely lady here is Sonia, all the way from Washington, D.C. And today, Sonia and I are going to talk about APIs, but we're going to take a slightly different approach to this talk. Um, we both have been through fairly major career pivots in the past few years that have led us to be in front of you here today as Rails developers. Um, so we wanted to take all of our past experiences and use this to kind of frame this conversation in a way that we thought might be relevant and interesting. So my background before I made the transition to Rails development was in architecture, as in bricks and steel architecture, not software architecture, and city planning. Um, Sonia also worked as a writer and graphic designer in a former life. Um, we've both spent a lot of time thinking about the building process and design elements. So to start off this presentation, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the importance of patterns in both the built environment and in software that support good design. Um, then I'll get into the meat of the talk and describe why we think you should consider building the API first. Then Sonia will go over some best practices and I'll bring it home with a bit of conversation about some tools and best practices that you can use to build your API. So as I mentioned, my background before I got the wild hair to become a Rails developer was in architecture and planning. So along the way, learning to program and learning Rails has been a fascinating journey, partially because everywhere I look, I find these parallels between the built environment and the Rails software stack. One of these parallels is the role that patterns play in both of these worlds. Before we dive into the meat of this talk, I want to tell a quick story about how I came around to this topic and why we thought it might be relevant to approach this topic from the perspective of design patterns. One of the most influential books in the last half a century in architecture is this book by Christopher Alexander, A Pattern Language. If you're unfamiliar, a pattern language in a nutshell is a method of describing good design practices. A pattern language should facilitate successfully solving very large complex design problems. These patterns are tools to help abstract away some of the complexity in our world so our little brains can wrap around how to approach solutions. Design patterns in the built environment go back hundreds and hundreds of years and are very much so rooted in how we as humans experience our surroundings and relate to each other. Um, and for me, as an architecture student, understanding patterns was a big part of my training. I'm sure you all guessed where this is going. So this book came out in 1977 in response to a few decades of really, really bad architecture um, that just went in the face of good design patterns that had developed over the ages. They ignored these patterns that support the tried and true way humans want to inhabit cities and essentially ended up creating a lot of buildings that were really awful spaces for humans. And so now we fast forward 20 years and these ideas reemerge in the software world and Martin Fowler, for example, is writing about patterns. Not only is he writing about patterns, all of the language that he uses to talk about object-oriented software design comes straight out of the architecture world. On this book's Wikipedia page, they point directly to Christopher Alexander's book as an inspiration for Fowler's work in software. Most people probably take it for granted at this point, but all of the language that we use to talk about software was lifted straight out of the architecture world. And as an extension, I think the way the profession thinks about the organization of things. We like to think that what we're doing is new, but take a couple steps back and the concepts are really the same. I don't know if Fowler and Alexander knew each other, but I think they would have gotten along. And one of the things I like to imagine is them going out on Tuesdays to drink cappuccinos and to have these really intense philosophical conversations about the order of things. Um, even though at a glance it seems they come from very different worlds, at a conceptual level I think they would be having the same conversation. So, 
coming back to Rails. When I started to think about software, I inevitably brought this lens of patterns with me, which meant I was super primed to drink the Rails Kool-Aid. Convention over configuration? Obviously, this was just really smart design. These conventions mapped very cleanly in my brain to patterns, and I just got it right away. At first, the process of learning Rails was just a smooth progression of these elegantly designed pieces sort of clicking into place. Then, inevitably, I stumbled into area after area where Rails does not provide conventions or strong opinions on what to do. And I would look to my right, look to my left, talk to developers around me, and realize everybody had a different opinion. And honestly, this is when learning Rails got kind of hard. And so this brings us here today. One of these areas that, I've, that we found without a clear sort of mainstream convention that everyone seems to agree on was APIs. Beyond using JBuilder and the basic Happy Path Rails application, there wasn't clear guidance how to deal with APIs. And honestly, this really surprised me. Um, seems to me, and maybe many of you, um, most of the hard problems I deal with today are related to data transfer. At my current job, this is what we do. We build applications that manage large amounts of data. This is a really important piece of our applications. And so thinking about this more as developers, as a new developer, I should say, when we have a question, um, I, of course, asked the internet. <laughs> this sent me down a rabbit hole where everyone was suggesting something slightly different, and nobody seemed quite satisfied with how they were dealing with this problem. I read about lots of solutions, all having varying degrees of success. It was all interesting and somewhat helpful, but it wasn't the solid answer I was looking for. And honestly, it was really frustrating. <laughs> I knew this wasn't rocket surgery, and it left me feeling like, OK, Rails, uh, if you're so opinionated, why don't you have an opinion on this? What should I do? Um, and so here we are. And um, we believe building APIs is one of the critical, er critical areas where we should have a shared solution. Because obviously, this is how our applications talk to each other. This is where my application and your applications cease to be my problem and your problems, and they're now everybody's problem especially if we have a public API. So for one moment, bring this back to architecture. Um, the evolution of our great cities is really the evolution of shared problems becoming shared solutions in elegant and innovative ways. We tend to think of the development of cities in terms of buildings, but buildings come and go in reality. The interesting story, and here I take off the architecture hat and put on the city planner hat, is, is really the story of infrastructure how we came together and agreed how electricity should be delivered, how our sanitation systems should be constructed, and how we wanted it to get from point A to point B. So the starting point of this talk is that APIs should act as the infrastructure for our applications. If passing around data is the most important thing your app does, then your APIs should be elevated from something we hobble together to something that we have a solid solution for. And starting with the API and building your client applications around it opens up all sorts of interesting possibilities. Carried out to the full realization of this concept, your APIs could be the foundation that supports a variety of clients, such as mobile applications or rich JavaScript framework clients. By decoupling your REST API from your client, you can more easily support multiple clients and have a system that is much more flexible but also organized. If a mobile interface is really important to your application, your REST API can support multiple native mobile apps with minimal duplication across platforms. This is a good thing. You can also use the same API to serve data to a JavaScript framework, again, with very little duplication. Your API should be the common denominator. Without a good standardized server solution, you can't have a standardized way for different clients to talk to the servers. All right, so we've discussed some reasons why for this new generation of Rails applications that must embrace a variety of clients, the API should be the foundation and where we think you should consider starting. Um, so one, your application will be designed to pass around data from the get-go. And reason two, if you need to support multiple clients, you can easily do this with minimal duplication across platforms. 
and 3. If you create the standardized server code first, you'll easily support the creation of standardized client code. Okay, now I'm going to pass it off to Sonia. All right. So let's discuss some of the API best practices. Um, there are a few that are very important to begin with when you're constructing your API. But before we jump into them, I think it's important to consider this question. Why is a well-designed API so important? Well, in this image, uh, we see falling water. Going back to architecture just for a moment. This is a cantilever home in Pennsylvania built in 1935 that is among one of the greatest assets to the architect and design thinker Frank Lloyd Wright. It is built partly over a waterfall, driving its name from its situation, and, will, and um, has been conserved as a museum now since 1963. So in other words, this is a huge asset to the legacy of Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, a well-designed API can be that of a company's greatest assets. Why? Because users invest their time in obvious and not so obvious ways. In the obvious ways, you're writing to it, buying products that use it, you tell your friends and communities about how great this API is, you start writing blog posts about it, you're creating hype, basically. The less obvious ways is that the users are digging into it and spending a significant amount of time learning how it works and playing around in the code. A poorly designed API can be a huge liability. The same users who would have been promoting it and using it as inspiration for new products are now calling, it, calling in for support and asking you what to do about the problems that you've created with the API and taking away from your productivity. Um, or worst case scenario, they're just taking one look at your API and then running away from it. So the first guideline to follow of the best practices is to design your APIs for experience rather than, and readability, not for data alone. In other words, an API should reflect how something is used, not just how it is stored. In fact, I hate to say it, but nobody really cares what your database looks like. People want to know how it operates, how they can use it. The experience should not fill your fellow developer with misery or regret. It should be methodical and consistent, which leads me to the next best practice of consistency. By providing a single API that can serve multiple clients, you get consistent client solutions across platforms. This includes having single endpoints and clean routes throughout your API. It's kind of like a telephone pole with all the cables and wires running through and around it. The pole is built with specific plugins for specific wires and purposes, allowing electricity to flow from the power plant to your computer screen or your light bulb or what have you. And similarly, an API call retrieves a particular data set from your database and expects a consistent return every time. Without this, we get this, the alternative. Um, something hideous and terrifying. Unfortunately, um, this slums infrastructure does not support consistency or a sustained development of regulated wiring. It is inefficiency at its finest, where everyone seems to have adopt, adop, adopted a to each their own mentality. You should never have your API making someone feel like this, so avoid that. Um, coming from the writing and editing world, documentation is so important, especially having learned how to code later in life. Um, I love a well-documented um, gem or you know anything I'm trying to use. I love when I see a lot of documentation and written the right way. Um, so documentation is very important to the widespread use of your API, public or not. <clears throat> it should act as a bonus layer of information, though, like a glimpse into a developer's mind that assumes nothing and notes everything. It should sit on top of an already easy to understand API. And so in other words, don't make the documentation do the dirty work. Your API should already be understandable, and you're just providing this layer of documentation on top of it. So if you're the type who just grumbled at my last slide, I know you're out there, um, let's chat about a service that makes documentation a cinch. Uh, one that we found was Apiary. Um, it's a structured interactive tool that follows the necessities of documentation using Markdown and a template for easy usage. The result is an intuitive um, document incorporating the basic necessities that all documentation could contain, should contain. So here's an example of Apiary um, and what it might look like when you're doing it. Uh, but generally speaking, Apiary or not, all documentation should include the following. Examples of the full request and expected response, a list of error codes, 
their significance, like what is causing them, a searchable HTML interface, and communication of versioning and deprecation schedules so you don't catch anyone off guard who happens to be using uh, an API, a version of your API that you're going to be moving forward from. So the lifespan of an API is important to consider. Um, it can be difficult to choose how you're going to version or what your strategy will be, but you should approach it um, as if you have to get the first one, the first version of your API absolutely right. It makes it easier down the road. Um, the most important thing, though, to remember is that versioning is inevitable and um, plan for deprecation from version one. I also like to think of APIs as if they were a rescue dog. If anyone knows me from Flatiron School, I see a few of you out there. I'm obsessed with rescue animals, so I had to tie this back in for a moment. Um, so this is not a Westminster Kennel Club winning dog, but, dog, but um, it's more like a little rescue pup. He has limitless potential to be an incredible pet if you let him get there. Just like you want to set your future dogs up for success, you'll want to do the same for your API. For starters, neither this dog or your API require any fancy things. They simply crave repetition and unconditional support in order to be successful. Give them what they need to involve into their new versions, but don't ever forget where they came from. Um, the JSON APIs is one standard for building APIs in JSON that is supported by the Rails community. So uh, this is Steve Klabnik's quote, uh, by following shared conventions, you can increase productivity, take advantage of generalized tooling, and focus on what matters, your application. And we liked the JSON API standards, um, so I put an example of it in here. Um, and like so many of the tools that um, we've discussed already today, there are more out there, and there's a lot of great ones being developed right now. So uh, Rosie's gonna share a few more of those with you. So, uh, building APIs is a shared problem for most developers. It seems there is now a general shared understanding of what a good API should consist of. Um, a shared solution is the next step, so we can turn these best practices into conventions. Um, for the last couple of months, we've been asking every developer we encounter what they use to build APIs. The answers were usually Rails or Sinatra with some combination of the tools available on Ruby Toolbox and uh, usually a partially hand-rolled solution. Um, we also heard more and more how Rails is being used to create a REST API that talks to a mobile client, and there seemed to be growing interest in using Rails for JavaScript frameworks. These may not be traditional Rails applications, but people still recognize the value of Rails for creating a REST API. After talking to lots of people, um, it was evident, though, that an, ag an agreed-upon solution still wasn't clear, and the whole thing just required way too much thinking. There are so many ways to hobble something together, but we wanted to know the Rails way. What will be the Rails way to build a solid API? Again, damn it, Rails, if you're so opinionated and committed to this idea of conventions, tell me what to do. We no longer have to be pioneers venturing out into the unknown. So in the middle of all these conversations, we did see a Rails way emerging, though it's not baked in yet. Um, lo and behold, there are solutions emerging from the core Rails team that provide an opinion on how to create REST APIs. We've been exploring Rails API in combination with Active Model Serializer for building an API where you only need the uh, JSON endpoints. Rails API is Rails. It utilizes most of the same generators and conventions and will look very, very familiar. Um, for this new generation of applications where the API is your infrastructure that supports a family of client applications, we think this is what the future might look like. The Rails API is really just a miniature Rails stack where they've skipped all of the stuff that you need if you were creating views, producing a solution that is lighter and faster than the full Rails app but it does still come with a full suite of baked in solutions for many poorly understood problems. And the documentation, there's a laundry list of things that are handled in the middle web layer and the action pack layer. This is definitely a win. Um, for example, you might understand perfectly how to hand roll a solution for IP spoofing attacks, or maybe not. But if, even if you do, why spend time doing this if Rails is gonna do it for you? Thanks, Rails. Um, 
And again, if there's a solution for something already out there, I'd rather use that than reinvent the wheel. The other tool we're exploring is active model serializers. In short, serializers replace hash-driven development with object-oriented development. Um, for example, with active model serializers, when you're using render JSON in your controllers, Rails will search for a serializer before for the object and use it if available. It's an elegant solution to creating server-side APIs that doesn't require a view layer. They act a lot, serializers act a lot like models and can be easily customized. Active model serializers also follows the JSON API standard. So you know you're creating a standardized API that will easily talk to a variety of clients. It really helps to take the guessing out of how your JSON API should be structured. Okay, so it's time to start wrapping things up. Um, a few points to leave, you, leave everyone with. Um, we find it's increasingly important to design APIs following patterns and conventions that fit into the system as a whole. To do this, we can leverage existing best practices and tools, and by doing so, we'll create APIs that support a more organized structure for our applications. I was inspired by Yehuda Katz's keynote yesterday, um, and I think it's time for us as a community to move API design out of the area of experimentation and into uh, the area of our collective shared solution. We'll all benefit. And again, trivial choices are the enemy. Um, drink your convention over configuration Kool-Aid, um, but brush your teeth afterwards. <laughs> Kool-Aid's not good for you. Um, but anyway, we're often trying to solve the same problem. And when this is the case, we should agree on a strong convention and all follow it. We'll all benefit in the end. And third, uh, don't forget about who or what else is going to want to use this API in the future and plan accordingly. This may include native mobile applications or a JavaScript client-side framework or something else that we haven't even imagined yet. By designing our APIs today to be consistent across platforms, we can make changes to our client-side applications in the future much easier. So tomorrow, someone's not trying to use your hand-rolled API that didn't really follow any established design patterns or conventions, and you have to explain that, well, it seemed like a good idea at the time. For those of you who aren't from Minneapolis, this is the ugliest building in the Minneapolis skyline. <laughs> so, a little context for you. Um, we all drive by and shake our heads, like, oh, why? <laughs> Um, or worse, um, your application gets scrapped because it was poorly organized from the get-go and too rigid to update. Oh, and last but not least, document all the things. Um, documentation is the key to your API being used successfully. All right, and we've come to the end. Um, I hope, just want to leave you with one thought. I hope when you approach your next project, you'll consider building your API first. Um, all right, thanks everybody.